chimps, you, I don't know if you know this or not, but chimps basically go to war. Uh, Jane Goodall discovered that a couple of decades ago, and it really, really was hard on her, eh? because she was kind of a Rousseauian. So, for those of you who don't know, Jean-Jacques Rousseau is a French philosopher, and, you know, French philosophers have an awful lot of sins on their conscience, and, of course, Rousseau was certainly one of them, because Rousseau was the first like what fully articulate promoter of the idea that human beings were basically good so you know we had a good soul in a moral sense but we were corrupted by our social institutions you know so uh, so you know as far as Rousseau was concerned it was kind of a noble savage idea you know like the human being in their raw form has a pure soul and then you know you you give them to parents and you give them to teachers and you know they get into politics and there's group disputes and then they get all corrupted you know, and, well, you know, that's, I don't know even what to say about that, except that it's absolutely moronic, you know, and, but it's, it's an appealing proposition if you're a naive optimist. I mean, first of all, it doesn't explain where malevolence comes from, because the people created the institutions, so, you know, it just puts you into an infinite regress, chicken and egg. If the institutions are reprehensible, but the people who built them aren't, then where did the reprehensible element of the institutions come from? You know, he might think it's an auto-generating consequence of organizing people, but, you know, it's a pretty specious theory. So, um, of course, he, he had a counterpart, a philosophical counterpart, Thomas Hobbes, and Hobbes said basically exactly the opposite, that, you know, people were vicious and cruel, and unless you, like, put them in straitjackets fundamentally and made them obey, then everything was going to go immediately to hell, you know, and... When, when you saw what happened in Iran after the Americans waltzed in and the power structure disintegrated, you know, it was a hell of a lot more like Hobbes than it was like Rousseau, right? You took out the, 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 the tyrant at the top and it wasn't like everybody got all peaceful and loving all of a sudden. It was like absolute chaos reigned. So, you know, of course you can rationalize that. But anyways, Rousseau, by the way, had five children by a, a maid, uh, an illiterate maid, that, that it was his mistress, and he put every single one of them in orphanages where, of course, they perished because orphanages at Rousseau's times were not exactly, you know, a luxury resort. And even up till the beginning of the 20th century, most children who were under one years of age who were in care institutions died, partly disease and that sort of thing, but often because they just weren't touched, they weren't cared for physically, even if they were fed. And, you know, 200 years ago, they weren't even fed. So, anyway, so, you know, but nonetheless, you know, people, people maintained the op optimistic idea that human beings were, you know, basically good and that they were corrupted by institutions. It's a common idea among, I think it's a very common idea in universities, you know, because university people are always complaining about the corrupt nature of this institution and that institution, you know, while they sit here in the warmth, with the electricity on, you know, it's surrounded by wealth that characterizes maybe one-tenth of one percent of the entire world's population, and, you know, they complain about how oppressed they are and how, you know, nasty the institutions are. It's like, yeah, well, you actually haven't been to a nasty institution, you know, because nasty institutions, they get pretty damn bad, and most of the institutions in the world are like that. So, it isn't exactly clear that people are pristine in their heart and then corrupted by institutions, you know, although I'm sure that happens. It happened to Panzram, for example. So anyways, this has been a line of philosophical speculation that's, that's, that's I would say, constituted one of the unspoken fundamental assumptions of, of Western intellectuals in particular. And Jane Goodall thought, you know, in many ways the same way. She thought chimps were basically, you know, they're just animals. They're okay. They exist, coexist relatively peacefully with one another. You know, even um, Carl Rogers, who I talk about a bit in my personality class, you know, he basically thought that people were fundamentally good and that institutions made them bad. And, but uh, the problem is, you look at chimps and they're a fair bit like us, you know, bonobos, you can look at them too, and they're, they're genetically quite related to us, and they're quite a bit different than chimps, but so we're sort of a weird mixture of the two in some sense, but chimps like those things, there is no evidence that they really have any internal control over their aggression at all. You know, there was a horrible case about two years ago where a woman was interacting with a chimp and it tore her to pieces, and they can do that, man. Like, it took her face right off, and they have the strength of about six men like an, an, uh, an adult male chimp can break a 300-pound test cable. You know, those things are really, really strong, and they're not friendly. 
you know, like, so in Arnhem Zoo, for example, uh, there has been a, uh, a troop of chimps there that have been followed by an extremely brilliant primatologist named Franz de Waal, whose work I would very highly recommend. De Waal is a very smart guy, and he's looked at the origins of morality in chimpanzees, you know, from a biological perspective. It's very, very nice work, very, very clear-headed, but, you know, he's recounted absolutely horrific stories of chimpanzee behavior. So one of the stories he talked about, for example, was, you know, you kind of have this idea that there's a male chimp hierarchy. It's roughly true. There's a female hierarchy too, but the males in the chimp world anyways tend to be the dominant ones. And, you know, you kind of think of a dominant primate like a prize fighter, you know, pretty much he's ruling because of his physical prowess. Now that turns out not to exactly be true, but in this particular case, the guy who was running the chimp troop was a bit of a bully, and he wasn't very good at making friends, you know, and that's not such a good idea, because no matter how tough you are by yourself, two weaker guys can probably take you out, and that's what happened during Franz de Waal's observations, and two chimps attacked the leader, and they had a coalition, they were grooming each other, they were pals, you know, and chimps are pretty good at remembering, like, re reciprocal relationships, and having friendships, really. Like, they have a very highly social structure. They just tore him apart. Like, the things they did to him, like, you don't even want to talk about. And so, chimps have really no upper limit on their capacity for aggression. And when they hunt, because chimps hunt and they like meat, they often hunt colobus monkeys, and they, they weigh about 35 pounds. Like, a colobus monkey is a major league animal, and they eat those things alive. And they scream while they're being killed, and that does not slow the chimps down one bit. So it's not obvious that the chimp is really a creature of a lot of empathy especially the males. The females are likely more empathic because they have to deal with infants for longer periods of time. What seems to inhibit the aggression of male chimps isn't anything they hold internally. It seems that when they get hyper-aggressive in the troop, the troop gets more and more agitated and basically shuts them down. So you can imagine maybe you're in a rough bar and some dingbat who's, you know, half psychopathic and has had two pints of alcohol is starting to cause a tremendous amount of trouble. Look, he's not going to shut himself down, but the rest of the troop might. And that kind of means that the control over the aggression is externalized. It's not a consequence of superego control. And we like to think that we actually control our own aggression, but I'm not so sure about that. You know, if you read things like, there's a great book, a horrifying book, published about 20 years ago called The Rape of Nanking, which is well, the woman who wrote it committed suicide, so that sort of suffices to tell you what the rape of Nanking is about. And it's a story about the Japanese in World War II going into a Chinese city called Nanking, where I believe about 350,000 people were killed. And the Nazis in that story were the good guys, so you can imagine the kind of brutality that might be been occurring there. But there's absolutely, perfectly well-documented evidence suggesting that the Japanese soldiers engaged in competitive brutality. You know, and so really what happened was the Japanese had been pretty militarized by World War II and they'd adopted a Prussian education system and the Prussians and Germans, you know, pre-20th pre century Germans, they were basically interested in educating obedient soldiers, you know, because it was a militaristic culture and the Japanese kind of adopted that because they were sick of being kicked around by the Europeans and pretty successfully because they defeated the Russians, you know, in the early stages of World War II of the 20th century. It was quite a shock to everyone in Europe and, you know, cause for great celebration in Japan and no wonder. But anyways, they militarized the hell out of their young men and taught them basically that the Japanese were a master race, you know, and that other people were subhuman. It's, it's a very common human way of thinking, by the way. I would say it's really the default way that human tribes think about other tribes. You know, I mean, it's a little more complicated than that because human tribes tend to trade with other tribes. So it's not all demonization, but a lot of it is, you know, and if you look around the world in the anthropological literature, what you see is that the names that most tribes have for themselves is something like the human beings or the people, you know, indicating that the rest of the people aren't really people, God only, they're barbarians or, you know, they live out where the sun is being eaten by the dragon of the night or something like that, and, you know, the word barbarian is a is a word that comes from the Greeks making fun of how non-Greeks spoke. They, you know, they thought they went bar, 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 something like that. So, anyways, what Goodall found was that the chimps, like the chimp adolescents in particular, in particular the males, would patrol the, the borders of their territory uh, in groups of three or four, and with often with a female or two, but the females didn't seem to be really the, the, the they weren't 
they were more part of the group rather than the initiators. But what the chimps would do is if they found a chimp from another troop, even if that was a chimp that had moved from their troop in the not too distant past and joined another, because sometimes the males leave and sometimes they go to other troops, if they outnumbered them, they would tear them to pieces. And it looked like that's why they were doing the border patrol. They're out looking for trouble. They're gangs, roughly speaking. They're looking for trouble. But the point of it is, is that, and they would only attack if they outnumbered. You know, because chimps can, I wouldn't say they count, but they have a rudimentary notion of group size, you know. I don't think you can count without being able to verbalize, but you can estimate at a glance. And so, you know, when I, mean, when I say tear apart, that's exactly what I mean. There's no upper limit on the brutality. And so Goodall discovered that first. And she didn't tell anybody about it. Now, she had her reasons. I mean, some of them, I think, were ideological. Oh, the lovely chimps, you know, and fair enough. But some of it was also, she thought that maybe the chimps had been corrupted as a consequence of their contact with human beings and that their natural behavior had been somehow transformed. You know, and that's not, it's reasonable to be cautious if you're a scientist before you go out and say, hey, chimps go to war. Isn't that revolutionary? Because it is, right? Because it just, it just ends the idea that our warlike and malevolent nature is a function of culture. Like if chimps do it, well, what, are they perverted by their own culture? I don't think so. You know, I mean, there are more and less violent chimp cultures and there are more and less violent baboon cultures. So there's some cultural variation. But since Goodall's time, this sort of behavior has been documented on many, many chimp troops. So that's us, in a nutshell.